All right, so I guess I'll get started. So hello everyone, I'm Claire Ludi, and as part of the MFC program, I'll be talking to you about evaluating forest soil indicators for Credit Valley Conservation Authority's Integrated Watershed Monitoring Program. So Credit Valley Conservation Authority, or CBC, operates within the Credit River watershed, which can be divided into three zones based on topography and physiography. The upper watershed zone is predominantly agricultural land, but still has a high proportion of forest and wetland cover and contains part of the Oak Ridges moraine. The middle watershed zone has the highest proportion of forest and wetland cover and contains the Niagara escarpment. And then the lower watershed zone is highly urbanized with a poor amount of forest and wetland cover, according to government guidelines, and is where the watershed eventually drains into Lake Ontario in Mississauga. Now, one of CBC's many projects is the Integrated Watershed Monitoring Program, or IWIMP, which aims to evaluate the status and trends of ecological indicators throughout the watershed. And within that is the Terrestrial Monitoring Program, which focuses on forest, wetland, and riparian ecosystems. The program aims to answer questions regarding the baseline conditions of key indicators, how the integrity of these systems is changing over time, how surrounding land use can affect it, and how management practices can maintain or enhance conditions. And the monitoring teams travel to various sites across the watershed where they collect information on indicators such as landscape features, tree health and downed wood, plant community dynamics, the status of fauna such as salamanders, birds and frogs, and soil properties. And this is then combined and quantified into one index to monitor overall forest integrity. So with that in mind, the objective of this project is to focus on the forest soil monitoring component of IWIMP and review and finalize which soil properties would be best suited as indicators for this program. Properties that are currently monitored will be evaluated based on their scientific viability and resource constraints to see if they should remain in the program, be modified or be discontinued. And then potential indicators that are not currently monitored will also be assessed based on these same considerations. But first, a bit of background on forest soil. So soils are very dynamic systems that are fundamental to many ecosystem functions, with the properties all playing key interconnected roles. So as an example, we can see here that the soil moisture property affects the environment, environmental filtering functions, as well as plant growth and water regulation, among many others. And healthy soil provides this medium for a multitude of processes, which also includes microbial activity and respiration, carbon storage, water and nutrient cycling, and pollution mitigation, which all affect higher soil functions. These properties and processes all influence each other with many complicated relationships arising, even when you just focus on one aspect. This diagram shows a rough idea of just how complicated and interconnected these processes can be. So for example, decomposition can be influenced by microbiota and fauna, which then goes on to influence toxicity, ion exchange and nutrient availability, all of which also influence each other. So you can see that if one aspect in the system is disturbed, there can be cascading effects throughout the entire ecosystem. But on that note, soil does respond to stress just like any other natural resource. Disturbances can alter nutrient cycles, deplete organic matter, decrease microbiota activity, among many other effects. Stressors or disturbances can take many forms, such as extreme temperature or precipitation events arising from climate change, pollution caused by runoff or atmospheric deposits, compaction or erosion from human activities, or even pathogens and invasive species but we can monitor individual soil properties and combine them into one metric and monitor the status of forest soil and integrity to detect any negative trends and react accordingly, which is what CBC's terrestrial monitoring program aims to do. So how do we actually go about doing this? Well, first of all, the soil properties that I wanted to evaluate were selected based on what I found in previous studies on ecological monitoring as well as what has been previously monitored by CBC. So for example, I wanted to consider attributes such as forest litter dynamics, erosion, soil texture, nutrients and pH, and soil biota activity and composition. 
So here is our final collection of indicators to assess. We ended up with 12 properties across three categories with our physical indicators being soil temperature, moisture, compaction, and erosion. Our chemical properties being nutrients, pH, soil texture, and redox potential, which by the way is a measure of electrochemical potential or electron availability in the soil. And our biological properties are litter decomposition and production, microbiota, and earthworms. And then for each one, there was at least one corresponding data collection method that I looked at because this can give us a better idea of how feasible it might be to monitor. And we also want to consider what any observed changes might be telling us. So for example, increasing levels of erosion at a site might indicate a corresponding decrease in soil organic matter and essential nutrients or an increase in soil redox potential might indicate low oxygen conditions in the soil due to flooding. So now that we know what we want to evaluate, we need to figure out how to do the evaluating. And for this, we developed evaluation criteria and split them up into quantitative feasibility and management criteria. The quantitative criteria cover the scientific aspects. So how it might respond to stress and if we can isolate that cause and effect relationship, how it changes spatially across the watershed and in time, how much supporting info we might need, whether it has quantifiable targets and how it interacts with other indicators and ecosystem functions. For the feasibility criteria, we want to consider whether we have the budget and staffing to monitor it, if it's currently or has been previously monitored, if there are sufficient monitoring sites and how easy it might be to collect and process data while maintaining a low potential for bias. And then in the management criteria, we want to know if there are relevant management options that actually exist and are known to improve the status of the indicator. And we want to know the spatial scale at which they are effective. So for each criterion, we assigned a score of three, which is the best, two or one, which is the worst. And the justifications are a little bit different for each indicator. So as an example, Data collection would score a three if it can be automated, two if a sample needs to be collected by hand, or one if it's a very time consuming collection setup. And for the management criteria, we decided to assign a score of one if there are no known management options. And because there wouldn't really be a reason to monitor it as part of this program, we would automatically cut it from the evaluation. And once we have the total scores for each criteria category, we can sum them up to get an overall score. This method really helps to reduce the subjectivity when deciding which indica indicators would be best to monitor. And it helps to compartmentalize all the aspects we need to consider for a monitoring program. And now that we have our indicators and our criteria, we can put it all together and do the evaluation. So I'll just go through the management criteria first. After consulting with my supervisors, we found that litter production, earthworms, and soil texture had no management option, options that CVC could feasibly implement even at the vegetation community scale. So for this presentation, we'll just focus on the ones that do and remove these. Um, we would, however, at some point like to collect info on soil texture just to provide context for the other indicators. So then from here, we can go into the quantitative criteria where scores were assigned according to what was found in the literature. And now, even though this is just a subset of the quantitative criteria, this is still a lot. So I'm just gonna uh, focus on soil biota as an example. So it's sensitive to stress such as changes in climate. So that gets a three, but signal to noise ratio, we're giving that a one because it's a little difficult to isolate any stress responses since there are so many confounding factors. Soil biota activity and composition can fluctuate rather drastically across space and time. So those both get a one. Um, we would need a lot of supporting information on the site, so another one. It does respond to low, medium, and high intensities of stress though, so that is a three. Um, we can't really create any set targets, so we'll give that a one. And the relation to other attributes in the, in the ecosystem is not very direct, so that is a two. And then continuing like this for the rest of the indicators, we can calculate the total percentage scores for each. So here you can see temperature, moisture, and compaction all scored relatively high, while erosion, redox potential, and soil biota scored relatively low. 
And then we just go through the same process for the feasibility criteria where scores were assigned based on recommendations and professional opinions of the terrestrial monitoring team. And again, as an example, if we look at pH, we give it a one for finances because sending samples to the lab can get a little pricey. Um, we do have the staffing to collect data for it, so that gets a three. It has been collected in the past, but maybe not consistently, so that gets a two. Data collection involves taking a sample by hand, so another two. Processing involves sending the sample to a lab, so that's a three because it's pretty easy on our end. And then repeatability is a two because there is some potential for bias in data collection. A minute mark. Thanks. And here you can see our total feasibility scores where again, temperature, moisture, and compaction all scored relatively high, but soil biota, litter decomposition, and redox potential scored relatively low. So summing up the final management quantitative and feasibility scores and finding the overall percentages, we can get our final scores. So again, we see temperature, moisture, and compaction all scoring relatively high, which is more or less what we expected from the start, since they share desirable properties such as quick data collection methods. They have a higher signal to noise ratio, so it's easier to sort out the confounding factors. And they have a clearer relationship with other soil and forest attributes, which is important to the IWIMP program. But litter decomposition, redox potential, and soil biota unsurprisingly had lower scores and might not serve as the best indicators due to shared features such as high spatial variability, expensive and time-consuming collection methods, a lower signal-to-noise ratio, so many confounding factors that might be hard to control for, and a more indirect relation to other forest attributes. So to conclude, the indicators that would be most effective under IWIMP are soil moisture, or sorry, sorry, soil temperature, moisture, and compaction. The indicators that are sufficient but maybe should not be prioritized are soil pH, erosion, nutrients, and litter decomposition. And then the indicators that are least effective are soil microbiota, redox potential, and the three we cut at the beginning, which were litter production, earthworms, and soil texture. So now that we have done our initial assessment, some next steps would include actually developing the protocols to start monitoring and collecting data on these indicators. And then further down the road, following the typical adaptive management approach and performing more of a statistical analysis to review the indicators once more. And I just wanted to add that this criteria scoring system is not specific to soil properties. It can be applied to other ecological indicators monitored by CDC. All right, well, that's the end. Um, I just wanted to give a huge thank you to Kelsey McNeil and Ben Kuttner for all of their support and expertise on this project, um, as well as CBC for the wonderful internship over the summer, and of course, my MFC peers. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, open the, the floor to uh, questions, starting with, with Kelsey. Great, thank you. Uh, and first, I just want to say thank you, Claire. We loved having you and we really appreciate all the work that you did with us this year. Um, so I have two quick questions for you. I was just wondering, uh, what were some of the challenges that you found in defining um, the criteria for assessment? So defining the criteria, that was a little difficult because some of them were already tailored to the climate change criteria system. Um, but for this, the soil program, it was hard because we had to consider all of the different indicators and some edge cases for each one. Um, so I think initially we didn't even consider the spatial and or temporal fluctuations, but then we realized that that might play a key part in the overall rankings. So just things like that, like um, little edge cases that you don't really consider until you do a little bit more in-depth reading on into it. Um, and then being able to develop the wording of those indicators so that you can encompass a wide range of indicators. Great. And then um, we kind of 
together developed this process so that we could reduce the subjectivity in kind of ranking different indicators. Um, but do you have any suggestions? I know there is still clearly some subjectivity uh, in the ranking system. Do you have any suggestions on how we could um, alleviate some of that or make it a little more objective? Yeah, so I think for that, it would help to get the opinion of multiple people, maybe people involved with um, different aspects of the monitoring and the processing, um, or even adding further criteria questions if um, we can end up, if we can develop any others. Um, so I think just having a variety of those inputs and um, tackling the problem from a variety of angles can really help reduce the subjectivity when evaluating them. Great, thanks, I'm done. Okay, thanks, Kelsey. Kelsey. Sean, would you like to go ahead? Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, it's great to see a, a good soils project. Um, mm -hmm. I'm surprised that there was nothing on soil organic matter. Uh, right. And, you know, that's pretty easy to get at least a, a, a proxy for using so soil color. So you need your Munsell uh, color table. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so so is, is that potentially going to be looked at or? Yeah, uh, so I didn't mention it explicitly here because I had actually, so when I looked at um, some of the research when I was looking at the indicators, um, I found a lot of papers saying that you can use the carbon and nitrogen content as an indicator of the organic matter. Um, and I had uh, lumped that in with the nutrients, the soil nutrients category. Yeah, so it's not really, it's not really nutrients. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, it was you know, listed. In any, in any agricultural system, the very first thing you'd look at for soil degradation would be organic matter content. And, right, yeah. Uh, and there's and there's pretty well established ways of getting a, a guess at what that is without doing a lot of lab work. Yeah, and I think um, just building off of the previous framework, it had been kind of listed in the same category with the nutrients, but um, it would be sent to the lab to evaluate. Um, but yeah, I agree. I should have maybe specified that because that is a really important property, of course. Yeah, so I, I, I do think thinking through carefully what you can actually do in the field mm -hmm. or without sending off uh, samples. Yeah, because it gets expensive send, it, sending it gets a lot of samples. It's very expensive if you do mm -hmm. if you do a kind of full soil profile, but there's a lot of things that you can do uh, that don't require all that lab work. Yeah. Uh, and so that that's that you know I think is it, it's really important to have actionable quick things to do and think carefully through those methods and what you can and what you can't uh, do, you know, using kind of proxy methods in the field rather than sending yeah. off, off uh, samples. Especially for a long-term monitoring project because you mm -hmm. don't want to build up costs too quickly. Great. Thanks very much, Sean. Jay, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Sure. Thanks, Claire. Uh, very nice presentation. Thank you. I was kind of curious about the whole idea though. I mean, you're trying to be decreased subjectivity to some extent here, but mm -hmm. I found the whole process kind of very subjective in that you decided how, you know, what criteria you gave them numbers, rankings, you get, got an overall score. I guess another approach, which I'm wondering about though, what would be, of course, you know, things have to be feasible and cost-effective, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering if a, a better way to go about doing this might be instead, why not, you know, try and get a suite of soils or areas where you expect to find different kinds of impacts, measure a whole bunch of stuff at that, <laughs> those pilot sites, and then use quantitative methods to see what comes out as being really good indicators of what you're interested in. So like compare to I'm the saying same measures, site? I'm saying measure as much of those things as you can at 100 sites across the range of conditions sort of in the watershed. Okay. So the and thing then, is- And then analyze that statistically to see what comes out as being really easily, what is, what is valuable and relatively easily done. Right, so 
something of that scale might not be feasible for a conservation authority. Um, I do but see where you're getting on, at, though. You're planning on spending a lot of money or doing this over time, so you're evidently willing to put resources into it. Yeah, but this is more of like an initial assessment to determine what to prioritize. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't at all evaluate some of the other indicators, but um, in terms of prioritizing which ones might be the most effective to start with, um, I think this helps. And also the quantitative criteria, the rankings did appear subjective because I didn't go into detail about that, but we do have um, justifications uh, taken from the literature for every single box that was filled out before we assigned the ranking. Cool, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a soil scientist, as you're probably <laughs> abundantly aware. Um, <laughs> I was curious about temperature and moisture though. I mean, mm -hmm. how does that, do you mean like moisture holding potential? Because I mean, obviously, do you mean temperature in relative sense? Because obviously if it's a hot day and it's just rained, you're gonna get a hot, wet soil, you know? So I was just wondering yeah. how does that work exactly? Yeah, so for that, we would have um, data loggers in the soil. So one for temperature, uh, one for the moisture in the soil. And of course it does change a lot in time throughout, like throughout the day when the temperature of the air changes, um, but also depending on where you place that. So if you're in the shade of a tree, um, you're probably gonna have much lower temperature scores and higher moisture scores than if you put it out in the sun, of course. So that's kind of what we needed to consider. And that's what this, this uh, scoring system helps us consider as well. Um, but for the temperature and moisture, that would just be like a logger stuck into the soil to collect information on the temperature and moisture. I'm not exactly sure how they work, but yeah. Cool, thank you. Thanks, Jay. Uh, ben, go ahead. Thanks. Thanks, Claire. I think that was a great presentation, by Thank the way. You. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you. Mm -hmm. I guess the first one, it's on this theme of subjectivity and reducing subjectivity. You mentioned during the presentation, the management criteria were taken into account and you eliminated some of the indicators immediately if there was no management alternative to try to rectify a change in any one of those indicators. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty arbitrary judgment. And what I'm wondering is if you looked at the scores with and without the management criteria scores, would that change the outcomes, do you think? Right, so that's a good question. Um, we did look at the scores without the management criteria because that was something we realized at the end that we needed to, con that we needed to include. Um, and we did have similar outcomes without the management criteria um, with the, I can't remember what it was exactly, like the uh, soil biota, uh, litter decomposition and redox potential, those came out relatively low, even without taking the uh, management criteria into account. And even the ones that I cut at the beginning, so soil texture, um, litter production, and the other one, I can't remember, but um, I think the feasibility also helps to capture some of those management apt aspects. And they ended up scoring pretty low in that regard too, mostly because of the data collection itself. Okay, um, and related to that, you, you even mentioned at uh, that point in the presentation that you might want to collect soil texture anyway, even though we've just eliminated it. So mm -hmm. um, I guess how, how married are you or the CBC to using this approach to select the indicators? Can you make exceptions outside of your scoring system? Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so um, I think soil texture is kind of a weird example because for that, it doesn't really change in time, um, especially like on a human time scale. Um, so treating that more as a supporting information, like more of a one-time collection idea is probably a better approach for that one. Um, in terms of using this for the rest of the indicators, I think it does spit out some pretty sensible results um, because I know CBC did measure litter decomposition at one point in the past using uh, decomposition sticks and that was one of the methods I looked at and it actually did, so using that method, it came out very low in the end. 
So it does kind of give a good indication of poor results and good results, results that we would expect based on um, like what was measured in the past and kind of using that as a control. Okay. Um, and then I, I have one more question. I believe you mentioned that, you know, um, the purpose of the program is to monitor forest integrity. And you mentioned there was some relationship between um, the soils indicators and climate change and detecting climate change type trends. Um, can you expand upon those a little bit, how your soil indicators can help um, maybe uh, with a couple of specific examples, uh, flag changes in climate? So it wouldn't really help us detect changes in, in climate, but more of a way of um, seeing how these systems are responding to changes in climate. So in particular, soil temperature and moisture, if we're seeing hotter and drier days, those values are going to reflect those changes. Um, and they can in turn influence the overall forest integrity, which may also be part of a bigger picture of detecting those early climate change signals. Um, so it's a very um, kind of roundabout process, but it does reflect the, uh, the response of these systems to the changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. That's, that's all I have for questions. Great, thanks, Ben. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, we're going to have to move on, Daniela. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can follow up with Claire afterwards.